Chapter 41 Hell is for Heroes December 24th, 2086 Orlando, Florida Noises and color swirled above Inez. She tried to reach them, but something was pinning her arms. As she struggled and strained against whatever was holding her down, Inez felt cold water running across her forehead. She's alive, a voice called out. Hold on, Nezzy, we're going to dig you out. Slowly, things started to come back into focus. Only a few minutes ago, Inez had been standing in the meeting hall of Disney University, showing off her new Shadowkeeper pistol to Chris Wright. Then there was a chaotic crash, and now Inez was buried underneath concrete and drywall. The building had fallen to pieces around her. Flashlights and voices filled the space as survivors worked to rescue those trapped below. Don't call me Nezzy, Inez mumbled. Who's there? The face of a Lavakian came into view. The lion-like alien smiled at her, showing his fangs. My name is Monkustrap. I'm with the Emerald Institute, he said. Hold on, my team is digging you out now. Honeydew, Von Richthofen, over here. A human woman and a Cybon male, both dressed in power armor, ran to Monkustrap and started lifting slabs of concrete off Inez. The Cybon, known as Honeydew, said, As soon as we clear this debris, you will be free. Inez could see her rescuers now. Honeydew was a great blue avian with iridescent purple plumage. Von Richthofen was a large woman with very short brown hair and a severe expression on her face. Where's Cassandra? Inez pleaded. Where's my sister? I'm here! Cassandra's voice called out. Inez was not sure if Cassandra answered via the psionic link or if she had simply shouted. Either way, the young girl was scrambling over the wreckage to reach the spot where Inez was being extracted. Like everyone else, Cassandra was covered from head to foot in dust. She looked like a ghost. What happened? Cassandra cried. What's going on? Mahuika crashed into the city, von Richthofen said, slammed right into us at speed. This time of night, I think about two million people may have just died, Monkustrap confessed. Perhaps more. Inez got free and was able to stand up again. She grabbed the Shadow Keeper off the ground and tucked it into her blouse. While Cassandra wrapped her arms around her sister, Inez took a look around. It was devastation as far as the eye could see. There was no way to recognize any nearby landmarks. They were all gone. Rubble from buildings and wreckage from vehicles was everywhere. Random starship parts were scattered about, still on fire. The flames provided most of the illumination, since a dense layer of smoke blotted out the moon above. Disney University itself was so effectively shattered that it was impossible to tell where the structure had once stood, or even what it looked like. Inez could see several hundred people milling about. Many were in shock and just wandered aimlessly. Others were calling out for survivors and digging into the rubble with their hands. About 50 yards away, there was a large group of people gathered around... something. Each moment, more and more people joined the assembly, some of them carrying bundles. Let's go over there, Inez said. Find out what's going on. Inez, Cassandra, and the three Institute members stumbled across the sea of wreckage and quickly reached the point of interest. Before they drew level with the group, however, Inez reached up to cover her nose and gasped in revulsion. She could smell the death long before she saw it. Hundreds of dead bodies, just dug out of the wreckage, were laid out in neat rows. People moved among them, trying to identify the dead. Mournful cries filled the air as some people found their friends and loved ones. No! Why, Sajuk? Why would you do this? Runhan Somta wailed at one corner of the field of death, refusing to let go of the lifeless body of Hali Mihaka. Like everyone else, Runhan was covered in dust, but the tears running down her face cut shiny streaks below her eyes that shone disturbingly in the night. 
a group of ancient Americans deposited the body of General Osmer onto the ground, taking it in turns to clear away the dust from his face and uniform. Colonel Mason Sharp looked around for more of his people. He seemed to be frightened. Finally, a group of mutons all sat in a circle facing outward. It looked as though they were guarding the body of Crew Chief Magra. Oh, holy Jericho, Inez breathed. It's a disaster. Inez had not seen the worst yet. Several soldiers, some of them GDF and others UN, called out. Make way! Make way! The group parted as a squad of soldiers arrived, carrying more bodies. Ruslan Shmial, the president of the UN Security Council, was laid to rest alongside the director of the Emerald Institute, the unnamed dragon-like advisor, and finally, the galactic custodian herself. Oh no! People gasped and cried. Queen Marka's body was broken and mangled, but she was still recognizable. Her silver hair, now saturated in dust, looked even more ghostly than before. So, Ragoba's dead, and so is the director, said von Richthofen. What do we do now? Inez cast a confused look at the Institute fighters. Ragoba was our squad leader, Honeydew explained. He was of honorable demeanor. Inez was devastated. She barely knew any of these people, but in the short time she had, she grew to respect many of them. It caused her genuine pain to see the galactic custodian dead like this. The woman had fought so hard to end this war, only to end up broken in the wreck of an old world school. Marka did not deserve this. No one did. Inez felt a tug on her skirt. She looked down at Cassandra. Does this mean you won't go to Canaveral after all? Cassandra said. What about the other kids? I... I don't know, Cass, Inez confessed. Suddenly, Cape Canaveral seemed so very far away. Just... just for now, let's try to get back to the Great Phoenix base, Inez told her sister. We can figure things out from there. As the two girls started to depart the scene, Inez noticed the trio of Emerald Institute members were following them. She did not object. Where would they go, anyway? Inez had no way of knowing what direction she was headed. Smoke obscured the sky and the city itself was flattened. She simply started walking over the debris toward the next glowing light. She could see it, just over a hill of plaster, metal, and drywall that was probably a building yesterday. Inez started to climb the hill, but another tug at her skirt caused her to stop. Cassandra was pointing back toward the field of dead. Somehow, Inez had missed two groups of people she knew well. And now, she found herself wishing Cassandra had not spotted them. The Wolverines and Stormbreakers were together, the former group having just arrived on the scene. Cassandra pulled Inez along as she walked towards them. As Cassandra pulled Inez into the group, Jay, Lawrence, and Sarah set down a body that was so badly destroyed it was impossible to tell who it used to be. No, no, there's nothing you can do, Jay said. She's gone. Inez felt her heart drop into her stomach. It was Piper Russell. Just the tone in Jay's voice was enough to confirm it for her. Hey, Ridge, Victoria said. We need another pair of hands. Can you help us out? Inez, almost in a daze, followed the Stormbreakers and Wolverines over the ridge line to an even worse scene. The Robinson family was here, or what was left of it anyway. Himawari was weeping over the bodies of four men while her father, Blake, held to her tightly. 
both Blake and Himawari were visibly injured. Two Saibon soldiers sprayed their wounds with nano medikits, pleading with the two humans to hold still. This time, Inez could no longer bear the traumas of the night. She fell to her knees alongside Himawari when she realized just who the dead men were. Pascal Etienne, Robert Lansing, Amako Potteriki, Marcus Robinson. In one fell swoop, Himawari was robbed of both her husband and her only sibling. Blake Robinson had lost his only son. Not like this, Blake muttered under his breath. Not like this. Inez, Victoria cried out. Lawrence, over here, we need help. Inez looked around to see what was going on. The Stormbreakers and Wolverines were digging frantically at a pile of rubble. He's still alive, Quarter panted. Hold on down there, we're coming to you. Inez scrambled to her feet and joined the dig. Setla, Quarter, and Kingi were the strongest of the group and carried away huge slabs of concrete while everyone else focused on smaller bits of wreckage. There's two more people down here with me, a Lavakian voice cried out. They can't breathe, hurry! Monkustrap, Honeydew, and Von Richthofen all joined in. In seconds, they could see faces. General McCavity of the GDF dug his claws into the drywall and pulled himself free. Following him out of the hole was a man dressed up as an American resistance fighter and Emmanuel Espinosa. Dad! Cassandra and Inez cried out before hugging him. I thought we lost you, Inez sobbed. And you might have, Emmanuel replied, if it weren't for Mr. Mara here. He doesn't lose his head in a crisis. Jay, Lawrence, and Sarah all greeted the American named Mara very warmly. This is the guy, Jay said. He led the Chippewa cell back in Michigan when we took Alpina. It's great to see you again, dude. When the hell did you get to Orlando? About an hour before all this went down, Bradley Mara replied. I brought about 30 Chippewas with me, but I think they're buried under all this. He gestured around. Killed before they got to fight. It's a real shame, Bradley said. So, this really was it then. Inez, like the others, was so preoccupied with digging out survivors and mourning the dead that the greater implications of what had just happened were only now starting to sink in. She looked around once more, and the full weight of the situation finally hit her. Orlando was destroyed. A city of 15 million people was suddenly and violently wiped off the map, and with it, the combined military force that would have assaulted Cape Canaveral. Several GDF leaders were dead, including the Galactic Custodian herself. The Mahuika was also gone, meaning there was now an opening for the Paradox and her allies to escape from the base. It was all over. Akira had won. Despairing, Inez sat down and put her head in her hands. The Stormbreakers, Wolverines, Institute fighters, and Robinson family members all sat down together, overwhelmed by the night's events. Maui raised his smart glasses to his face. They were cracked, but still functional. He saw that it was just past midnight on December 25th. Today was the anniversary of the Battle of Archer's Canyon, a great moment where Vetu Kealoa, the first Partogan queen, led her people to a glorious victory against a superior foe. Maui remembered his history lessons on Auraki. He remembered the words of Tohunga Nixie, passed down from generation to generation, about how Vetu assaulted the Snowskin Fortress, fending off enemies who wielded weapons she had never seen before. During the Wars of the Famine, Vetu was motivated by the knowledge of what would happen if she failed. 
Partogans and Lavakians alike, would have died out. All would be lost. Now, the men and women huddled together in the ruins of Orlando found themselves in a similar crisis. The paradox held every advantage. Numbers, weapons, and psionic power. Her enemies were laid low, disorganized and crippled beyond the ability to fight or even prevent her escape. The war truly was over, and Akira was, at the last second, victorious. A conversation, soft at first, began to fill the air among the group. Some fighters were trying to discuss a plan for what happened next in the face of this disaster. Secretary General Robinson wanted Emmanuel and Inez to flee north, taking Cassandra with them. He accurately pointed out how lucky everyone was that the sudden destruction of Orlando had not caused Cassandra to transform and go on an Emerald Avatar rampage. Emmanuel pointed out, also accurately, that Cassandra had recently displayed control over her powers for the first time. He also said that protecting the young girl should be prioritized over all else. Nainu wanted to gather up as many fighters who were able and willing and then launch an assault on Cape Canaveral regardless of the massive disadvantage. Emma von Richthofen told the group she wanted to contact the Galactic Council and seek new orders. Lawrence, Jay, and Sarah all wanted to scatter and go back into hiding in preparation for yet another guerrilla war. Finally, though, someone brought up a topic that needed to be discussed but was being avoided. Where's Jericho? Setla asked. The last time I saw her was at the signing ceremony, about 15 minutes before the roof caved in. Lawrence stamped his foot on the ground. She's probably buried under all this, he admitted. And as much as I hate to say it, I think Jericho is dead. There's no way a frail old woman can survive something like this. I did, said the voice of Secretary General Robinson. Everyone fell silent. And Jericho has survived far worse than a building falling on her. None of you saw her at the battle for Earth or the war in heaven. It will take an act of God to kill that woman, I assure you. And if you want proof that Jericho is still alive, then take a look at my grandchild. Victoria blushed as all eyes suddenly fell on her. Instinctively, she curled up into the fetal position, covering herself as best she could. This was not really necessary, as while Victoria's dress was nearly destroyed, she was still covered from head to foot in dust. I don't get it, Emmanuel said. What are we supposed to be seeing? Search your memories. Has my grandson always looked like that? Blake replied, putting a lot of emphasis on the word grandson. Inez was the first person to understand. The psionic illusion, she gasped. Victoria, uh, I mean, Varian, you're still under Jericho's illusion. We can still see your real self. Victoria looked down at her own arms and pulled at the hem of her tattered dress. Holy shit, Victoria breathed. So wait a minute. Jericho is still alive and maintaining the illusion, Blake said. My wife is holding down the fort in Berlin, and thank goodness for that. But if Chihiro were here, she would tell you about her own experiences with the gift. She would point out that keeping up an illusion like this is not a challenge, especially if one is experienced. Jericho is maintaining the illusion subconsciously. She's probably not even aware of it. General McCavity nodded. If that's the case, I need to gather up some soldiers and start digging. We need to get Jericho out of wherever she's trapped. Nainu sprang to his feet, looking excited. Good idea, he said. While you do that, we'll go to Canaveral and hold the Paradox down until you can send Jericho with some reinforcements. A dumbfounded silence occurred as everyone looked at the tiny lizard. I'm sorry, what? said Sarah. I don't know if you've noticed, little guy, but we are in no shape to fight anyone, let alone the Paradox. Nainu sighed. 
I know that, he admitted. But the alternative is unacceptable. Right now, Akira has psionic weapons, soldiers that are loyal to her, and total impunity to use both. To say nothing of those three star cruisers. Nainu clambered on top of some wreckage, looking down on his seated audience. You've got to remember, we're not alone out here. The Galactic Defense Force still has units all over the Sol system. They will have seen what happened and will come to our aid. Thanks to Stormbreaker Robinson and Stormbreaker Tachibana, the UN government is slowly coming around to our side again. We can expect help from them too. But what good is that help if it arrives after the Paradox makes her next move? Inez felt her heart swell with affection for this little guy, and she stood up to join his plea. He's right, Inez said. My mom has the advantage right now, but we can take that away from her. All we need to do is get to Canaveral and take those kids out from under her nose. They are the key to Prometheus. If mom thinks someone is making a move to take the kids, she'll drop everything to protect a crucial part of her plan. We'll keep mom's focus on us until the cavalry arrives. There's only a handful of us left, Strap said. You're talking about a suicide mission. Akira has got her own personal army in that base. You really think a couple dozen lightly armed folks can break in and secure over 200 children? 53 people brought down the entire Advent Army, Secretary General Robinson said. I was one of them. Do not doubt your own abilities. That was enough for Inez. She walked out of the group and turned back. I'm going to Cape Canaveral, she said. And I'm going to keep my mom busy until General McCavity brings back up. Who's coming with me? All six Stormbreakers, the three remaining Wolverines, Emmanuel, Bradley Mara, the two Cybon soldiers, and the trio of Institute fighters all rose to join Inez. They were committed to the fight now. Now that Inez had a fighting force, all she needed was a way to get to Canaveral from here. That was going to be difficult. The space planes Archangel and Niagara were nowhere to be seen. They were either buried or destroyed. The transportation issue was solved, however, when word of the renewed plan to assault Canaveral reached the other group of people Inez saw earlier. Several survivors volunteered to join Inez's self-styled suicide mission. Runhan Santal volunteered at once, bringing along a Higaran man who worked as a crew member aboard the pirate ship Ashoka. Colonel Mason Sharp joined as well, bringing a fellow ancient American with him. Finally, with a great crashing sound, Irabic showed up, riding on the shoulders of a Batera warform. The machine stood about eight feet tall, while it was not as tall or imposing as a sectopod, it was better than no mechanical help at all. Finally, the mutons and andromedons of Grey Phoenix were able to pull shipbreaker Carfu away from the body of crew chief Magra. Carfu not only volunteered for the mission, she also brought good news about a transport. If it's still there in the junkyard, you might be able to fly the Kakama. Several Mutons and Andromedons volunteered to stay behind with General McCavity and Secretary General Robinson. They would dig Jericho and any survivors out of the rubble, and then send reinforcements to Cape Canaveral as quickly as they could. General McCavity promised to lead the charge personally. But before the party left, the Mutons and Andromedons handed over their weapons. Inez and her allies walked away carrying laser rifles, plasma cannons, and gauss guns. Irabix Batera attached a railgun to its arm for good measure. Leaving the wreckage of Disney University behind, Carfu led the party to a barren hole in the ground that used to be Clear Lake. Whatever destructive force attacked Mahuika and Orlando had lost its power this far north of the city. Here, buildings and starship parts falling to the ground did most of the damage. Larger structures had managed to remain rooted to the ground. Inez felt sick when she realized how many bodies were strewn about the scene, illuminated by the flames of burning homes and cars. For the third time that night, Inez felt a tug at her skirt, and this time it was very unwelcome. Cass! Inez gasped. 
What are you doing here? I thought I left you with Blake Robinson. Couldn't stay, Cassandra mumbled, half crying. I don't want to lose you again. You can't go where I'm going, Cass, Inez said. Battles are no place for little kids. You could... Inez wanted to say you could get hurt, but she knew Cassandra all too well. It was much more likely that Cassandra would harm everyone around her, friend or foe alike. Cassandra picked up on her sister's line of thought right away and began to cry. I don't want to hurt anyone, Cassandra protested. I'm not doing it on purpose. Oh, I know that. Inez took Cassandra's hand and squeezed it lightly. And I'm really glad for that. I don't want you to be, well, a killer like me. Again, Inez had changed her sentence just before speaking it. Even so, she felt disgusted with just how much she was like her mother. Please don't leave me, Cassandra sobbed. I promise I won't hurt anyone. Inez hugged her sister, and an idea came to her mind. Hey, do you remember that moment at the beach where you were kind of floating around in your own bubble? Uh-huh, yeah. Can you do that again? Inez asked. Please, I would be so happy if you could do a psionic shield again. That way I'll know you're safe. The Grey Phoenix base was a wreck. A multi-story office complex had fallen onto the facility before smashing into millions of little bits. Clouds of paper billowed about in the darkness. But perhaps most crucially of all, the starship Kakama was still there. The historic Partogan frigate was looking even more battered than it did during both the Battle of Araki and the War in Heaven. But she was clearly intact. We don't need her to go far, Carfu said. Just about 80 miles to Canaveral, and she's rugged enough to survive a crash landing if push comes to shove. Well, Nezzy, what do you think? Inez squeezed Cassandra's hand and then loaded her plasma rifle. Everyone load up, she said. We're doing this, and don't call me Nezzy. 23 men and women, one Batera, and one child clambered aboard the Kakama. As the aged vessel fired up her engines for one last journey, the team of rescuers made their introductions and got to know each other. The group who would attempt the rescue at Cape Canaveral was a motley crew, consisting of people from all over the galaxy. There were 11 humans, Inez Espinosa, Lawrence Ridge, Jay Lansing, Sarah Roberts, Victoria Robinson, Mason Sharp, Emmanuel Espinosa, Bradley Mara, Emma Von Richthofen, and Ted Navarro, a friend of Sharp. There were three Cybon. Claws of Honeydew came from the Emerald Institute, while Beak of Lavender and Plume of Maroon were with the Galactic Defense Force. Two Higarans. Runhan Somtal brought Navin Soban from the Ashoka. She explained to her new comrades that Kith Soban was the greatest warrior clan Higara had, and Navin could be trusted in battle. Kingi, Cassandra, and Corder were all hybrids, each one having genetic ties to the Partogan Lavakian Commonwealth. Erebic, Maui, Setla, Nainu, Karfu, and Monkustrap were the only representatives of their respective races Ozcox, Partogan, Mycor, Muton, and Lavakian. Grim handshakes were shared around the old bridge as the Kakama's nuclear power plant thundered to life one last time. Creaking and groaning, the old starship lifted off the ground in an almost reluctant manner. Her engines and armor made deep groaning sounds that warned the vessel could fall apart at any moment. And she lurched forward leaving behind a few scattered pieces of her engine bell as she went. At stake this morning were the lives of 200 alien children, and perhaps the final chance to stop Akira Robinson before she became unstoppable.